Hi, my name is Paul Barrett and I'm one of the scientists behind the scenes here at the Natural History Museum in London and I'm giving you a little bit of a sneak view of some of the things that are down in our collections. And in particular today I'm going to be concentrating on a dinosaur that's very close to the heart of those of you on the Jurassic Coast, Scalidosaurus, the dinosaur from Charmouth. So Scalidosaurus has been known since the late 19th century and the first specimen of it to be found actually came from Black Ven and was discovered in about 1858. And it found its way eventually to Richard Owen at the Natural History Museum, who provided the first description of the dinosaur, as well as giving it its name. So Scalidosaurus means arm lizard. And the reason for that is we, we know a lot about the marine reptiles that come from Charmouth. And there's a suspicion that maybe Richard Owen wanted to distinguish his new land living dinosaur from all those other marine plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs that they're found with. He also named it after the person whose collection it came from, John Harrison, who seems to have acquired the skeleton about 1857 or 1858, and then it came into Owen's hands for him to work on and provide a first scientific description and also to name it. Owen actually provided a really great description in 1861 and 1863 with beautifully illustrated plates of the whole skeleton, which by then he'd had his assistants chisel out of the rock. Scalidosaurus is about up to about three or four metres in length. It's a four-legged animal, a dinosaur that lived on the land, not in the sea alongside the ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. And it's known now from around six or seven skeletons, some of which are exquisitely preserved and show huge amounts of anatomical detail that let us work out how the animal lived and also how it was related to the other dinosaurs that it shared its world with. The cliffs at Black Ven are about just under 200 million years old. They're some of the oldest dinosaur remains from the UK, from the earliest part of the Jurassic period. And they represent a time in Earth history when dinosaurs are coming into their own, starting to take over lots of different terrestrial ecosystems all around the world. And actually, Scalidosaurus is one of the best preserved early dinosaur skeletons we have, knowing almost everything about its anatomy now, thanks to the combination of information we have from all of these different remains. So when Scalidosaurus was first found, though, it was unprecedented. It was by far the most complete skeleton of a dinosaur that had been found, really, up until that time, with a skull, lots of evidence of what was happening with the limbs, the backbone, the ribs, and also with uh, the armour plates that were found to be covering the animal's body, which at that time was, had only ever been seen in one or two other animals. So this was something that Owen was very excited about when he worked on it, but after his descriptions, it hasn't been worked on very much. For most of the rest of Scalidosaurus's scientific history, we've been relying on Owen's descriptions, until David Norman, a scientist at the University of Cambridge, uh, spent a long time describing all of this material in some detail. Many Scalidosaurus fossils have ended up here at the Natural History Museum in London, but others have also ended up in museums in Cambridge, Bristol, and also in Lyme Regis, so it's possible to see them in lots of different places. So what do we know about Scalidosaurus? As I said, it's a four-legged animal, fairly chunky. Unfortunately, I can't show you the whole skeleton right now, but this is a cast of the of skull as it was originally found and prepared out of the rock by James Harrison. You can see it's a fairly large animal. The skull would have been, when it was complete, because it's just missing the end of its nose, probably something like 25 to 30 centimetres in length. You can see a very large eye socket in here, the lower jaws still attached with the skull, and if you look very carefully, you'll see a row of teeth. Now those teeth tell us that this animal was a herbivore, a plant eater, uh, because they are worn in a way that suggests that the teeth were used for grinding, and also they lack the kind of snake knife-like serrations that we see in more carnivorous animals. So it's quite unusual for a dinosaur of this age to have a nice three-dimensional skull, and it's, this is not the only one. This is a cast of the original specimen that's here in London, but we now have other exquisitely preserved skulls, which you can see in, the, in Bristol, that also fill in many of the extra details of what was going on with this animal. So I do have a small bit of original Scalidosaurus head here to hand, and this is one of the lower jaws of that original Scalidosaurus specimen. You can see it's quite chunky, it's quite robustly built. Uh, this big process at the back is where the jaw muscles would attach into what are now these smooth areas just here. And you can see this beautiful row of teeth. And if I bring it in nice and close, you might even be able to see some of those wear surfaces on the teeth, where the teeth in the upper jaw were rubbing against it as this animal was processing its plant food. You might also see that down in this corner that the bone looks very roughened. 
And that roughened bone is actually quite important because it's showing that the bone itself was actually remodeled as the animal grew. It wasn't just formed, but it grew and it was altered through the animal's lifetime. And that's a characteristic of a group of dinosaurs that has some other famous members as well, the armored dinosaurs. And Scolidosaurus is, the early, is an early member of that group. It also includes things like Stegosaurus and also the tank-like dinosaurs, the Ankylosaurs. So Scolidosaurus is one of the earliest members of this group. It predates the origin of, saur of the stegosaurs and the ankylosaurs. And there's a little bit of debate about its exact evolutionary relationships, but most scientists think that it's close to the common ancestry of those two big groups of armoured dinosaurs that come a bit later. So it's actually very important in our understanding in general of the evolution of the bird-tipped dinosaurs because it helps provide an earliest date for when the armoured dinosaurs really started their evolutionary journey, along with a few other dinosaurs known from elsewhere in the world, primarily from China and North America. But of those, Scolidosaurus is by far the best preserved, uh, the only one known from complete skeletons and the only one known from multiple individuals that actually help us to fill in those precise details of how it was related to the later uh, armoured dinosaurs and showing us more about its lifestyle. It's quite unusual to have found Scolidosaurus, which is a land-living animal, in a marine deposit such as the uh, milestones and shales that get uh, exposed on the shore at Lyme Regis and Charmouth. It's thought that these skeletons were washed out to sea from the land masses these animals were living on when they were caught in floods in rivers. Some people have suggested that actually all of the skeletons we found might be from a single herd of Scolidosauruses that got washed out together, given they're only known from this one spot at Charmouth. And while that might be possible, some of these remains that we know as Scolidosaurus come from slightly different levels in the cliff. So it's not just one event, but there are probably several reasons why these animals are accumulating here. And it would be great to find Scolidosaurus remains somewhere else, but they're not known from anywhere else in the world, or indeed anywhere else in the UK, just from this very small strip of beach at Charmouth. And they do still turn up occasionally, uh, 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 but not very often. So sadly, they're quite rare. They're much rarer than the marine reptile remains that we're also very familiar with, thanks to the work of collectors like Mary Anning. And just how rare is actually underscored by the fact that despite Mary Anning was so successful at finding fossils at Lyme and Charmouth, she never found a dinosaur fossil. She never found a Scolidosaurus. So she doesn't actually, unusually, have much of a role in the early development of dinosaur studies in the UK, although her influence in other areas was really, really important. So I've already mentioned that Scolidosaurus was an armoured dinosaur, and just to prove that point, here are a couple of really beautiful bits of armour from one of our Scolidosaurus specimens, these spine-like uh, processes, which are probably somewhere on the back of the animal, maybe over the neck. And you can see they have these very sharp edges to them, this very kind of coarse woven bone surface texture. And actually we see lots of different types of armour over the body of Scolidosaurus. It has horn-like armour plates on the skull. It has kind of knobbly armour on other parts of the skull where the skull bones have got roughened and textured. It has these conical spines over the back and the limbs, other much lower wedge-like spines over the, over the same areas also. So quite a large variety and all over the body surface on the arms and legs and going down onto the tail. So it would have been quite well defended against some of the meat-eating dinosaurs that we also know were living around at the time, but whose remains are much rarer at Lyme and Charmouth. In addition to this original specimen of Scolidosaurus, what we call the holotype, the one that the, uh, the individual that the animal's name is based on, we have other skeletons of Scolidosaurus in the museum, and perhaps my favourite one actually is the dinkiest. And this is another skeleton that was collected in a single nodule found on the beach at Lyme Regis, and this is of a little dinky Scolidosaurus. So you just saw me holding up the skull of the original Scolidosaurus, about 30 centimetres long. This is one of the hip bones of this other individual, which is actually from a juvenile, something that's much, much smaller. This is the ilium, the top of the hip bones. And you can see this is only about 12 centimetres long. So this is from an animal probably reaching up to about a metre in length overall with its very long tail sticking out from behind it. 
Another reason, apart from there being acute baby Scolidosaurus, is this it also has some evidence of Scolidosaurus's skin. And again, I'm not sure I can zoom in enough for you, but you might be able to see this kind of rough and knobbly texture on the top of the ilium just there. And if I were able to show you in more detail, you'd see that some of that looks like patches of skin. And this is an animal where bits of the skin seem to have shrink wrapped the rotting uh, body and been stuck on the skeleton as the animal was being preserved. So we also even get an insight from this and also from some other fossils about what the skin texture of Scolidosaurus was, which seems to have been scaly like other reptiles and not feathered like we see in some of the meat-eating dinosaurs. Again, just to give you an idea of how tiny this particular specimen is, here's one of its leg bones, it's one of its thigh bones. And you can see it's almost the same size as kind of a big chicken bone or a turkey bone. This is not an animal that was a giant by any respects. So in addition to having these grown-up Scolidosauruses that we can use uh, to work out how they're related, we also can say something about the growth of these animals. Although that works still in early stages, no one's really got into the details of it yet, but we do have the potential to see what changes happen in the skeleton as Scolidosaurus grew up, which is surprising for such an early dinosaur, as many of these things remain mysterious for a lot of dinosaur species. So Scolidosaurus has a really key position for us in our study of dinosaurs. It provided the first really complete dinosaur skeleton for scientists to study from anywhere in the world. It turns out that it's a very early relative of this great group of armoured dinosaurs and show how you turn an unarmoured two-legged dinosaur into an armoured four-legged one and helps to, uh, fill in a gap in the uh, evolution of those groups. And in addition, it's a beautiful addition to our knowledge of the dinosaurs that were living in the Triassic period in the UK and it has links with other similar dinosaurs from all over the world of a similar age spanning from China to South Africa to North America. So charmless dinosaur it may be but it has international implications. Thanks very much.